A few words from one of our local authors and painters, D.H. Lawrence. The essential function of art is moral, not aesthetic, not decorative, not pastime and recreation, but moral. The essential function of art is moral, but a passionate, implicit morality, not didactic, a morality which changes the blood rather than the mind, changes the blood first, the mind follows later in the wake. I wanted to share this poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins for our meditation rather than as the closing words. I asked myself about the title, Why Pied Beauty? It's like the Pied Piper who wore clothes of patchwork, variegated colors and hues and weaves and textures, almost a, a pointillist vision of the world. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, and rose moles all in stipple on trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape pieced and plotted, fold, fallow and plow, and all the trades their gear, tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. To love is to see the beauty around us, in a blade of grass, a loaf of bread, a hummingbird, a beloved friend, a human form. May we have eyes to see and hearts to celebrate it all. So be it. If you had been in Chicago uh, just the right time, you could have gone to the Art Institute there and seen a show titled Studio of the South, which was an exhibition that brought together the works of, of Paul Gauguin and Vincent van Gogh. The idea for showing their work together arose from the fact that they were painting companions at the end of 1888 in the south of France. This was a collaboration that began with very high hopes. Vincent had envisioned uh, the beginning of an art colony where creative spirits could emotionally and financially support each other in their enterprises, but like many high-minded ventures, this one ended on a sour note. After a series of increasingly heated arguments, Van Gogh recklessly threatened Gauguin with a razor, and later that night, in a fit of remorse, he cut off his own ear. But despite their bitter parting, the two men had much in common. Both came to art relatively late in life, and both understood art to be an explicitly spiritual undertaking, much as D.H. Lawrence said, a moral endeavor. The son of a Dutch reform minister, Vincent, had begun his career as a theological student, a missionary, living and working among the poorest of the poor. And although he eventually abandoned the faith of his childhood, he would say that that does not keep me from having a terrible need of 
shall I say the word religion, and then I go out at night and paint the stars. No one who, who's ever seen Starry Night would doubt that he had the most intense private visions that would lead him beyond the bounds of genius into realms of madness. Shortly after parting from Gauguin, Van Gogh was hospitalized in an asylum, but whatever angels or demons were haunting him would not go away, and he shot himself in the summer of 1890. During his lifetime, he had sold just one painting. I hope I do a little better. <laughs> <laughs> Gauguin's upbringing was less religious. He was born into a, a middle-class family in France. He spent time in the Merchant Marine before becoming a successful stockbroker. But at the age of 35, he abandoned his comfortable life. He also abandoned his wife and five young children to devote himself to his muse. Uh, following his disastrous liaison with Van Gogh, Gauguin fled Europe and sailed for the South Seas, seeking, as he said, to shed everything that was artificial and conventional. He wanted to, to revisit paradise via the primal, the wild, the uncivilized, but the titles of his works like, Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where are we going? Suggests that he found more questions than answers on his journey. Like Van Gogh, Gauguin tried to end his own life, but the attempt was unsuccessful. He eked out a few more years with help from a sympathetic dealer in Paris, but both men ended their lives on a note of failure. It's one of the ironies of history that these two are now acknowledged to be among the masters of modern art, a reversal of, of fortune that holds for many of those with whom they associated. After being rejected by the critics and the arbiters of taste, a circle of painters that included Monet and Renoir and Degas and Cezanne, others who'd broken with convention to explore a, a freer, fresher approach to putting pigment on canvas, they'd begin organizing their own shows as an alternative to the ex official establishment in 1874. And uh, one of the pictures in that first exhibition was called Sunrise, an Impression. And that name stuck so that today the image the impressionists have created have become icons of pop culture. We all know them. They're pasted on everything from coffee cups to tote bags. But in their time, they were considered to be radical, if not completely ridiculous. One newspaper reviewer complained of paintings where pink skies overhang a lilac forest. The trees are blue in another picture, and the heavens are brown. In one portrait, he continued, a pea-green woman, evidently in the last stages of Asiatic cholera, moves at you from out of the shadows. But just as exasperating as their free hand in color was the subject matter of these paintings, which uh, was unconventional for the time. Art was supposed to deal with mythological themes or, or grand historical subjects, you know, think of Washington crossing the Delaware, or, or else it was supposed to be peasants in, in exotic garb and romantic poses. What serious art had never before considered were scenes that were unposed, that were casual, that were non-idealized. Degas said that what he wanted was to observe life through a keyhole, to see it in its unvarnished, unguarded moments. Of course, what he really wanted to see through the keyhole were naked women getting out of the bathtub, but that's another sermon. <laughs> Often the Impressionists worked outdoors in, in the plein air. They preferred the, 
shifting moods of light and shadow to set studio pieces. And, and the reason I think that these quick brush strokes do what they do, why we, why we seem to like them, is that they successfully capture what is evanescent and, and what's glimpsed in passing by focusing on what's, what's fleeting, what's impermanent what's barely worth noticing. Their pictures seem to have become strangely resistant to the passage of time. It, it is precisely in the impermanent and the transient that we come closest to what's eternal. Ordinary life can be extraordinarily beautiful, but it's a matter of of perception, as spiritual teachers of all traditions have reminded us. The place to find illumination is here and now. It's right on our own doorstep. And maybe this is why I tend to prefer the paintings of Mary Cassatt to those of better-known contemporaries like Van Gogh and Gauguin. She and and Gauguin both showed their work for the first time together with the Impressionists in 1879. But while Gauguin and Van Gogh would seek their muses on ever more remote locations on the extreme fringes of civilization and the tortured edges of human experience, Cassatt found her inspiration much closer to home in, in the figure of her mother reading the news newspaper Sister Lydia working on her tapestries, often choosing models who weren't particularly young or attractive, but just plain and, and sturdy, as in one canvas that now hangs in the National Gallery where there's a woman seated on a park bench. She's resting her head against one hand and, and gazing down contemplatively at, at the other where she holds a red Zinnia. She seems, she seems to be inviting us in, in this and, and in many of her works to be entering into this act of contemplation to, to see and appreciate just what is immediately in front of us, what we, we hold in our hands. In her fictionalized account of Cassatt's life, Helen Scott Chessman offers this description of Sister Lydia's reaction to the painting of a child's bath done in 1880. It's like a gift, this oil painting, when May shows it to me. A calm moment, a mother squeezing a cloth in a blue and white basin, her hand large and strong, her other hand holding a sleepy child, legs akimbo, eyes half open, gazing at her, her face bent to gaze back, her forehead touched with light, her morning dress a white landscape on which he rests, becalmed idle in this moment before bathing, so clear, so still that it remains cut out of time. Always the hand hovers poised in the water of the basin, always the mother bends toward her baby, always the baby bends toward her, outside the room, the world moves on with its ships and trains, its republics, its foreign colonies, its industry, its injustice, its war, its terror. The world becomes merely a thought and something other than this quietness, this room, this careful love. Cassatt would become famous for her portraits of mothers and children. And uh, she protested in 1913 when Congress enacted legislation making Mother's Day a national holiday. She could, she could foresee what Hallmark would do with this thing. You know, her, her, her visions never slid into sentimentality, yet for a woman who chose to remain unmarried and childless, they do reflect the importance that family and friendship had in her life, unlike Van Gogh or Gauguin, whose spiritual journeys were essentially solitary and ended alone. Cassatt lived with her 
parents and her sister in Paris and during her brother's frequent visits the home was filled with nieces and nephews and the laughter of children. After her sister Lydia's death she'd find close relations with other women and I have to say with respect she did disinherit several of her family members when they refused to support votes for women. And yet, despite this, I think Mary Cassatt is a good model for religious pilgrims because our spiritual path shouldn't be pursued in isolation. It's, it's not something separate and apart from other men and women. So most teachers have recognized the importance of community to spiritual growth. And Cassatt's paintings of mothers with their children seem to remind us of the biological and spiritual fact that none of us comes into this world alone, that in fact we were loved even before we were born. Now she probably wouldn't have described her own work in such explicitly religious terms like many women in the Victorian era. She she needed emancipation, including emancipation from traditions that circumscribed women's spheres. She was fortunate to study at the Philadelphia Institute of Art, one of the few institutions that would admit females at that time. And when she told her family she was, she was leaving to study art in Paris, her father said he'd almost rather see her dead. And Degas, who recognized her talent and and became her mentor, said of her that no woman had a right to draw that well. <laughs> but she was strong, she was ambitious, she persisted despite the obstacles. She wanted to make a name for herself, and she did. She achieved success. She sold hundreds of paintings during her lifetime, not just one, she became not just an outstanding woman artist, but one of the world's great painters. <clears throat> Few of us will ever achieve that level. Many of us may identify more with her sister Lydia than with Mary, wondering if our lives, our, our work, our hopes will amount to anything sensing our own mortality, struggling with dreams deferred, disappointments, and yet each of us can be an artist, each of us can create some beauty in this world, whether it's an intimate moment, or a job well done, or a relationship nurtured, or a day well lived. Each of us is creative with gifts to share, a kind word, a listening ear, an open heart, a comforting presence. In ways we might not even recognize, we can be an inspiration to others in how we deal with difficulty, like Degas continuing to paint, even as he was going blind. Living is an art, and the point is not to make monuments that will survive and outlive us when we're dead and gone. The point is to be awake and alive. Now, to the dazzle all around. words are from Bob Ross. Oh. He said, every day is a good day to paint. <laughs> <laughs>